Hi everyone and welcome to our latest webinar in our series. Um, it's great to have so many of you join us. Um, so the webinar today in partnership with the Diversity Project is all about executive diversity in investment management. The session will last no more than an hour and we're going to send over a recording afterwards. If you have any questions, please add them in the Q&A box and we'll make sure we have time for them at the end. Uh, we'll also circulate around a feedback form um, if you really could if you could spend the two minutes to give us feedback it'd be fantastic to hear what you thought of this session how we can improve it moving forward and then also other topics that you'd like us to cover in this series and um, today we're lucky enough to be joined by two fantastic speakers each with their own perspective on this topic uh, kate grussing is managing director of sapphire partners an executive search firm with a keen focus on providing creative and balanced shortlists Kate is a regular commentator on diversity, women's careers and advancement in executive and non-executive roles, particularly in financial services and investment management. And we'll be sharing her experience of working with clients ranging from Credit Suisse to EY. She'll give us a 15 to 20, 20 minute overview of how they approach executive diversity at Sapphire. Adrian Benedict is head of real estate solutions at Fidelity. Uh, he'll be sharing his personal experience of executive diversity, both good and bad from the broad range of roles he'd have, he's had in finance throughout his career. And will give us an overview of how Fidelity are tackling the challenging topic of creating diverse leadership teams. Adrian will speak for around 10 minutes before we open up to a Q&A at the end. So please do get thinking about any questions that you want answered now and add them to that Q&A box. As always, we've encouraged all of our panelists today to focus on actionable insights. So we hope that you all leave today ready to implement changes immediately. Uh, and before we get started, I'd like to thank both Kate and Adrian for joining us today. Before handing over to Kate, I'm going to start by introducing Instant Impact and, and briefly setting the scene. Um, so I'm Rob, I'm one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of Instant Impact. We're in-house recruitment experts. We work as an extension of our client's HR function to provide the team, expertise, marketing and technology that our clients need to make high quality, diverse hires directly whilst working with them on global trends ranging from remote working to diversity, which is, of course, what we're going to be focusing on today. Diversity is something that we put at the heart of all of our client partnerships. After all, how companies define, identify and hire talent is one of the key tools for successful DEI policy. And one of the trickier elements that we face when working on improving our clients diversity is the question of executive and board level diversity. We all know how compelling the moral case is for diversity in your leadership team, but you may not know that the business case is just as strong. McKinsey's 2019 Diversity Wins report found that company in the, companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity were 36% more likely to have financial returns above their national industry median than companies in the bottom quartile. And for gender diversity, that financial outperformance was 25%. The same study found a 48% likelihood for the most gender diverse executive teams to outperform the least diverse executive teams. Why? Because companies that are more diverse are able to attract and win top talent, able to understand their customers better, win more business and make better decisions. So you'd expect companies to be bending over backwards to build diverse leadership teams. But the reality is a far cry from that, unfortunately. The more senior in an industry you get, the less diverse it tends to be. Only 3.3% of FTSE 100 chairs, CEOs and CFOs are from a BAME background, and that number hasn't improved since 2014. BAME representation in the most senior 20 roles actually dropped from 8.8% 8, 8 .8 in 2018 to 7.4% in 2019. And gender diversity is really no better, with only 9.7% of executive positions filled by women. To bring those stats home, Green, Green Park exec search just found no black chairs, CEOs or CFOs at FTSE 100 companies this year. It's clear that something needs to change. It's our collective responsibility as an HR community to have the challenging conversations with our leadership teams, to influence internally and make the business case for improving diversity and executive level clear, and then to do something about it when we have the opportunity to recruit, both by attracting a diverse pool of candidates and ensuring that whenever you're interviewing for an executive level role, you are proactively considering candidates from a wide variety of backgrounds, not just the contacts of your existing leadership team. And then by ensuring that your selection process offers equal opportunities to all candidates to make sure that you hire the very best candidate, regardless of background. 
You can find lots of resources on how we suggest improving diversity at all levels of hiring on our diversity hub on, on our website over at Instant Impact, uh, which we'll share a link to now. Uh, and we'll be focusing today's session on how to improve executive recruitment. And with that in mind, uh, I'd like to hand over to Kate, who's going to share some of the insights from Sapphire Partners' work on improving diversity in exec search. So Kate, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks very much, Rob. I'm really pleased to be here supporting the diversity project and the broader investment management industry. Let me give you a little bit of background, if I might. Sapphire Partners is a 16-year-old search firm. We would describe ourselves as a boutique, and we're very much focused on financial services and investment management. I've been working in financial services, I must say, for 35 years, so I'm bringing more than just my headhunting hat to this. I'd also like to share I'm a mother of four, so I think it gives me a perspective that's broader than just my day job. Sapphire has won awards for our work, really promoting diversity and um, trying to look more holistically. We are fortunate enough to work with some enlightened clients in the investment management sector, including Newton, BNY Mellon, and Fidelity International. But I think one of the things that's given me the best insight is in 2016, I helped set up and I'd say I'm now the curator of the Senior Women in Fund Management Network, which is a network of senior female investors. Uh, so with no further ado, Rob, if I can get you to move to the next slide. Of now I'm guessing some of us might remember the good old days of going into an office in the city and taking a wonderful black taxi. Um, I saw this ad on a taxi about this time last year. And because it might be a bit hard for you to see, what the picture says is, our fund manager's most useful tool, a good pair of shoes, unquote. It pictures a rather masculine pair of tired looking brogues. Now, I actually think this is a very amusing ad and it is eye catching, but it says in one amusing picture, how much of the ingrained challenge the sector needs to address. We can move on, please, Rob. In my time this morning, I'm going to try to touch on these three questions and share my insights on what you can do in your firms to improve the balance one hire at a time. We're not here to talk about boards or executive roles. We're really talking about um, the where the senior heavy lifting happens in your companies. But as all of you will know, recruiting is only one part of the jigsaw puzzle when it comes to developing talent. I think a lot of the topics I touch on will be broader than just the context of um, executive recruitment. Next page, please. So there are 13 challenges here addressing the question of why is recruiting of diverse talent not as good as it could be in investment management. There are a mix of supply and demand and process. And I'll attempt to briefly explain them and they're, from my perspective as a search consultant, having worked with talent hungry asset managers, as well as having been a coach and a confidant to many women in the sector. The very first one, um, and I think, by the way, I should say, none of these are, are brain surgery, and I'm, I'll be interested to hear later, Adrian, how much, many of these resonate with you. But we get any number of role descriptions given to us by um, hiring managers or HR directors where you know, there's a long list of must-have for the candidates. And I see my job as a search consultant to really... Um, try to uh, assess which of those are required and which of those are nice to have and the extent to which a client can broaden the role criteria can make a really big difference to being able to take someone for example from an accounting firm or from a consulting firm or someone who might have lateral experience in another asset class. Second point is one which um, we often get called in by an HR director to do a search when um, perhaps a search hasn't gone to plan or an internal promotion process hasn't been successful. And we're often given a relatively short period of time to work our magic. 
I am very sympathetic to a hiring manager needing to have a vacancy filled right away, especially if he's had an unexpected resignation and the time pressure that then can be put on the recruiters or search firms limits the ability for the search consultant to be creative and to tap less obvious candidates. Third point, which I'm sure is why we're all here today, there's a perception that um, the pool of diverse candidates is quite small, but diversity is many things in my book. It's not just gender, it's not just ethnicity, it should also be cognitive approach. It should also be socioeconomic. It should also be age. Um, so I, my colleagues and I are often um, pleased to tell our candidates, actually, you know, clients are much more open-minded than they have been in the past. And likewise, we're pleased to tell our clients the pool's a lot bigger than you may think. Fourth point I'd touch on, um, often recruitment is seen as a very transactional um, matter. And so if I'm a diverse candidate, I may not know the headhunter who's on the phone. I may not never have spoken to a headhunter. I may not have a CV ready. Um, I may not be able to well articulate what it is I'm looking through next or what my strengths are. And so that transactional approach um, can be difficult when it comes to tapping um, candidates who are less experienced. The fifth point, obviously this is a generalization, but many diverse candidates can be quite understated and cautious. I was on the phone with one this morning who is um, so soft-spoken and not good at trumpeting her strengths and her achievements. And so it'd be easy for a recruiter to overlook how talented a candidate was. Six, I think is something we're all really familiar with. It's really easy for any of us as um, recruiters or headhunters or hiring managers to recruit in our own image. I remember once talking to a hiring manager who reflected on the fact that she'd been a synchronized swimmer. And she realized after having made quite a few hires that there was a relatively high portion of synchronized swimmers in her team. You can bet that um, was a great example of recruiting in your own image. Um, it's point number seven. I'd like to think our clients are doing much better at, but often candidates will tell us that through a whole recruitment process, they didn't meet a single person who looked like them. So you know, that it is a really, um, what I'd say, a no-brainer um, thing that we try to make sure our clients don't fall into that trap. Uh, point number eight, search consultants and recruiters can often work too narrowly and just turn to the list they used on their last search or turn to the candidates that um, are on their database rather than working harder and going that extra mile. Point number nine, um, there are some fabulous internal resourcing teams out there in investment managers. Don't get me wrong, I think they serve a really important function. But if I'm a candidate at a competitor, I'm going to be much more cautious to return the phone call from um, Rob at my art rival than Rob at um, Sapphire Partners. And so that getting that, that balance right and understanding um, what it will take to turn on that candidate is important. Point number 10, um, lots of new hires will assume if they have a great flexible arrangement at their current firm, that they would be unlikely to be able to replicate that at a new firm where they haven't proven themselves. Often candidates don't even have the confidence to ask. So um, you know, that's something that um, recruiters need to really understand what is the feasibility of a new role being done in a flexible way. And for investment management companies to be really bold and proud in promoting what their approach to um, supporting flexible working is. And in this time of agile working where we're all working from home, it's not something we can take for granted. Point number 11, and again, this is a generalization, but diverse candidates can often be exceedingly loyal to their employers. Um, that's part of why they're fabulous to recruit and why they may be less prepared, for example, on having a CV ready or returning a call from a recruiter or a headhunter. Point number 12, I do think the industry can do more to attract candidates from outside the sector. 
and to broaden our reach. For example, you know, climate change is something that is of growing importance to the investment management sector to understand. Well, we're not we're going to get the best thinking on climate change, probably from outside of investment management. And lastly, a, a really problematic issue, and it obviously isn't true for everyone who works in investment management, but if you're a portfolio manager, moving firms, much like taking a maternity leave or taking a sabbatical can be very problematic with regards to the investment track record and how consultants assess that. So um, I know I've covered a lot of ground here, but I wanna make sure we have time to get on to some of the ways to address this and to having a conversation with Adrian. So if I can ask you, Rob, to move on to what all of you can do to remove these barriers in your firm. I'm afraid there is no silver bullet, um, but neither are any of these nine actions things that are um, patentable. They all are areas which I'm optimistic most firms in investment management have started to undertake. First, I think it's essential to educate and encourage hiring managers to consider recruiting from outside their narrow gene pool. I understand not all roles is that possible for, but look at the ability for someone, for example, to move asset classes or to move geographies or to move functions. Secondly, um, and this is obviously related, think about how you can broaden the role criteria. Does it really need someone with 15 years worth of experience? Could it be someone with 10 years worth of experience? Third, and this is something that I think has a lot of resonance with um, women and millennials in particular, I think the sector is doing amazing work to um, improve corporate governance, to look at factors like climate change, I think in the whole investment management sector needs to do more to their fabulous work through companies. I think that will help us attracting, as I said, millennials and women in particular. Fourth, and this is a bigger topic, as I mentioned on the prior slide, we should be able to help the consultants figure out how to enable investors to bring their track records with them when they move roles or when they take maternity leaves or breaks. And for example, having co-heads of teams is a good way to manage that. Fifth, try to loosen the time pressure on recruitment mandates. Does that shortlist really need to be ready in three or five weeks? And what could be done in looking at building bench strength? so that when you do have an unexpected resignation, you're not starting from square one. Six, um, all of us should be doing more to coach and encourage diverse candidates to build relationships outside the firms with peers, with um, thought leaders, and certainly with recruiters and headhunters. Of course you'd say, of course Kate says that. I can't tell you the number of confidential conversations I have on mandates that I have absolutely nothing to do with. And I think that will return itself in spades longer term. Um, seven, talk about flexible working that works in your firm. Talk about the great examples of it. Often I know many, many men work flexibly, but they do it in an informal way. Well, that, those are great examples too. Um, and then lastly, um, using search firms that have a demonstrated commitment and track record of promoting diversity. Ask your search firm or the search firms you're interviewing next time you're looking at a panel. So what has their commitment been? What has their delivery rate been? And what do they do that's above and beyond um, to really help cultivate that pipeline for the future? If I can get you to turn the page, please, Rob. So um, on this page that Rob will turn to, what I uh, covered many of this in what I've been talking through. I Rob, hopefully you can turn to the top better um, balance. Okay. I will keep top talking. Tip, top tips for, uh, for better balance. And I might of these tips be in the interest of time. So um, the second tip 
look hard at which search firms or recruiters you're using. Make sure those search firms to promoting diversity. Um, I'd emphasize also the third point. What are the different networks you support, not just internally, but externally? Point number eight, I might highlight, what gets measured gets done. Hold your hiring managers accountable. Check the data. If the best candidate is a middle-aged white man, then I want you to appoint that middle-aged white man. But know what the proportion of diverse candidates was on the long list and the short list. And think about the candidates who maybe weren't quite ready, but would be valuable for your bench in the future. Point number 11, the one I'd highlight. Diverse candidates can often be less good at selling themselves. When you look at that CV or you're interviewing that candidate, ask yourself, you know, is, is this person really understated? Are they perhaps um, inexperienced? We had a candidate interview last week who hadn't had an interview in 15 years. We gave her some practice interviews, but we definitely told the hiring manager that. As so let's move on. Um, I guess the one thing I'd want you to take away from my presentation, I really think there's never been a better time to recruit diverse talent, but it does take effort and know-how. It takes a combination of approach to interviews, thinking about partnering with the right recruiters and head building relationship and making sure you have the right ambassadors internally. Next slide, please. I think we all need a bit of humor in these long, dark winter months. We're often asked um, for miracles or to attempt very changing searches. And as the next slide, we'll see. Um, there are no fairy godmothers. Um, I'm, my colleagues and I are very happy to undertake a challenge and um, take on a tough brief looking for something that's really quite hard to find. You have to also be realistic. As I said, there are no fairy godmothers out there. It takes a lot of hard work from all of us working together. Next slide, please. I think but that was the final slide. To all of you HR directors and resourcing managers out there, please know that there are more great candidates than ever if you know where to look and how to attract them. And the cartoon on the next Rob will show momentarily, hopefully. Uh, those, those um, that has a cake. woman in a kitchen and she yeah. says, I do a little cooking, some baking, and I also manage a $2 billion mutual fund. Great. Well, Kate, thank, thank you so much. Uh, really very thought provoking and a fantastic overview of some of the different things we can do to increase the focus on diversity in our executive recruitment, whether that's uh, recruiting directly or working with a search firm like Sapphire Partners. So thank, thank you so much. Um, before I hand over to Adrian, just a quick reminder to keep populating questions in the Q&A. Um, Liz, thank you so much for your question already. I promise we'll get to it and hopefully we'll have some fantastic other questions as well um, by, by the end of the session. Um, before we get on to Q&A though, I'd like to pass over to our final speaker, uh, Adrian Benedict. Adrian's Head of Real Estate Solutions at Fidelity um, and he's going to share some of his personal experiences from across the financial services industry and outline some of the work that Fidelity are doing to improve executive diversity themselves. So uh, thanks for joining us, Adrian. Yeah, thanks very much, Rob, for inviting me and uh, apologies for the, uh, the slight heart attack moment at the start um, since I couldn't quite find the Zoom details, but uh, I guess that's the modern way of working these days, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, you can't just rely on somebody being there because you can see them. Um, but um, yeah, as Rob explained, uh, what I'm hoping to do is just give you a bit more colour, very much more from a personal perspective, um, both as, you know, as a prospective candidate, uh, but then also um, from a, a hiring manager's perspective. So, uh, you know, starting really, I think, uh, for me uh, personally, just give you a bit more colour. I came into financial services back in the 90s. Uh, my parents, my family didn't have any experience in financial services. Um, and so for me, it was going into a sector that I knew literally nothing about. And uh, 
you know, Kate mentioned, uh, you know, giving diverse candidates a bit of a, a, a leg up or a bit more of an understanding about, you know, you aren't necessarily going to know it all. Um, I still remember walking into those first set of interviews. I'd done a degree in civil engineering. I knew nothing about accounts. I knew nothing about financials. For me, I couldn't even understand that uh, to, to, you know, to, to come up with the enterprise value of a business, you'd add the debt to the equity. It's like, okay, but that's a liability. Why on earth would you add a liability to an asset? It just makes absolutely no sense. Um, but then, you know, fast forward the clock, what I've been doing since then, um, as mentioned, uh, started actually in a global accountancy firm, then moved on into investment banking, uh, undertook a multitude of different roles within there, and then uh, more latterly have found myself in investment management. And I'm going to say something which is perhaps a little bit controversial, but I think it's something that we just need to recognise. My experience has been that uh, a lot of financial services have been on the journey around about creating and seeing the benefit of a more diverse employee base than investment management has been. I'd say it's a good sort of like 10 years behind, maybe even further behind the rest of financial services. And you know, when I come to reflect on why that might be, I think part of the challenge is that investment management, uh, it might not feel it today, but certainly for the last two to three decades, it's actually been a relatively predictable place we've not really had significant external factors having an impact on us as a business or indeed the model in which we employ. Fast forward the clock since GFC, it's been huge. And the pace of change has accelerated to a level that very few within the industry have ever witnessed before. When I look at it and compare it with my own experience, however, um, I remember going through a similar period in 2000. I remember going through a similar period in 2007. I remember going through a similar period in 2010. There's been these things happening in the rest of financial services, but less so in investment management. And, and I will come on to explain what, why the, all of this is relevant. As a result, a lot of the other parts of financial services have realized you need to have a genuinely diverse range of talent at your disposal. It's as simple as that. So I still remember in that first cohort of people when I started my first job, you had people who studied theology, engineering, arts, the sciences, you name it, everything under the sun. And actually one of the best investment bankers I ever had the pleasure of meeting was actually somebody who thought he was gonna head off to the seminary, but decided partway through his journey that wasn't necessarily as calling and ended up becoming uh, quite a successful investment banker. It just gives you an idea about just how diverse a range of experience as people had, and that's what the employers wanted to recruit. So on, on stepping into that particular organization, I remember walking into the, uh, to the floor and just going, wow, I've just walked into the United Nations. That's literally the feeling I had. Um, and it was a multitude of voices, a multitude of different countries represented there. Um, and so for me, when, when we reflect on how we go about changing and you know, recognizing this, I think a, 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 lot of, a lot of things have happened over the years, but I still do believe that there needs to be that mindset change. So I don't think that's quite there. I think the, the conversation's going in that direction, but I think a lot needs to still happen. And so for me, when I talk about mindset change, I think um, Kate hit the nail on the head in terms of the narrowly, def narrowly defined nature of the role. If you try and describe what I do, you cannot. Even my boss doesn't quite know. It's quite interesting when we go into a meeting and he tries to explain what I do, I would just laugh and they go, well, Neil, you didn't say that last time. Um, that's what you want from your talent. Um, and the reason for that is because we have no idea what's coming down the road tomorrow. Those days are long gone, whether we like it or not. And so for me, when I'm thinking about the kind of talent I want to bring into my team or my organization, the things that I've got in the forefront of my mind are attributes rather than skills. The skills we can develop, or they've got some of them already. It's the attributes that they really bring to the table. And those are things like resilience, 
ingenuity, compassion and integrity. And do we believe that is confined to a certain group of people? No, we do not. Where are you going to find the most resilient type of people? It's quite often those people who've had to go through a detour in their life, whatever that detour might have been. So a very simple rule that I have whenever I'm um, selecting my long list of candidates to interview, I will make sure at least 40% of those candidates have had a detour in whatever shape or form that might be. And when you start then talking to these candidates, but it does not come out on a piece of paper, it only comes through an interview. So if you screen them out, you will never realize half of these attributes. Then you really start to understand what resilience means to them. And then you think, right, if I can put that resilience into a work environment, I know what I can achieve as, uh, as their line manager or indeed as their colleague. But as I said, a lot of that is very much a function of mindset change. One of the things as well, uh, which we've had as a challenge, particularly in the last few years, is just recruiting and you know, getting a diverse selection of um, candidates coming through the door. And I've had to have quite robust conversations, both with my internal HR colleagues, but then also with our recruitment uh, firm that we've hired and said, look, why am I seeing this data in this form, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, by the way, I should uh, uh, add, I'm a data geek. Everything's about data for me. If it's coming through in the numbers, then I can get very quickly behind it. You can change my mind, basically. Um, and for me, I would say, well, uh, you know, again, addressing some of the points that Kate uh, described, don't define diversity by one measure. So investment management for the last decade has defined diversity principally by one measure, which is gender. I'm not questioning the, the, the reasoning behind that. What I am saying is, well, don't use the uh, word diversity, call it gender diversity as your primary objective. Don't broaden it as being diversity because by its very nature, diversity is <laughs> a lot broader. Um, but you know, uh, uh, around that say, well, here are the numbers of those 30 CVs, if you break it down in the following way, actually 80% were coming into two groupings. That's not diverse. But as soon as you, as a hiring manager, play that back, the recruitment firm that's working for you, anyone who's worth their salt will go, right, we really need to reevaluate how we're doing things. And I think that's really what we as hiring managers need to be doing more of, because then, as recruiters and others, you know there is a willingness and there is a desire to have a truly diverse range of candidates coming through. Um, and that's certainly what we've done and that's what we're trying to do. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, for, for we as a, an investment management industry, we've got to remind ourselves of what investment management actually is about because it's quite often forgotten. So I have, and it's ingrained in all of my team members, we're custodians of capital. We do not own that capital. We're looking after it on behalf of others. And custodian is probably the best word to capture that. What has, is happening is before custodian of capital meant almost exclusively pursuit and maximization of return. Now our investors are telling us very firmly and very clearly, it is a lot more than that. We don't quite know exactly what it is, but we're telling you it needs to be a lot more than just simply maximization of profit. So we have had sustainability and impact investing coming through in the last decade. We are now having um, diversity and inclusion. So it is our responsibility to hold those boards to account for their recruiting policies. It is our responsibility to hold those boards to account for sustainability policies and executing that. But how are we going to do that when we turn the mirror upon ourselves and we don't actually fulfill our own uh, goals and objectives of those that, that we, uh, you know, we invest in? I think that for me neatly brings me to the end of my bit, which is saying, well, it's great, but we need to be having metrics. We need to assess our own progress. And for me, I think you know, the, the stats that you highlighted, Rob, is one measure. Uh, and and uh, I don't want to dismiss that, but what about the next level? 
and the next level and the next level of people. Where are the successes? How long? And be honest and upfront. How long is it going to take before you can actually have a meaningful representation of diverse talents? So I think people around the call will be saying, look, from a gender perspective, it might not be happening and evident today, but you know it will happen because there is now a much more substantial number of women moving into those senior ranks. So you've now got that field of talent coming through the system. Do you necessarily have that field of talent in other diversity, uh, diverse groups, question mark? And if not, what are you going to be doing to address that? And so for me, you know, it is a journey. Um, uh, we've got to be honest with ourselves about exactly where we are in that journey. And I think we can learn a lot from the rest of financial services. Fantastic. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Adrian. We've already had lots of questions coming in. So I might, might start with a couple of questions for you. One in from Liz, who was asking around. So uh, you outlined how you're approaching uh, hiring for diversity within your own team in Fidelity. How do they group it up across the business total to have a consistent approach? And how, with data being so key, how is it, how is it measured and, uh, and tracked? Yeah, um, let's face it, for a global firm, it's an absolute minefield because in different jurisdictions, you've got different regulations about the kind of data you're allowed to collect, et cetera, et cetera. So much of what we're doing, at least at Fidelity, is very much on a voluntary basis. We're not taking a view that we can compel people. But what we are doing is saying, look, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know, it's the just show, highlighting to people actually what this is going to be enabling uh, senior management to be able to do is to put measures in place and then in due course almost targets and hold ourselves to that so that's the first thing that we're doing is it's trying to establish that that, that that state of where we are today simultaneous to that we've already started to put in place actual targets in senior management roles saying right within x number of years we want to have this number of people in there now, the challenge back is we don't want this to be then suddenly turning into, well, you're only there because. No, what we want to be having is actually saying, look, these people are coming here fully on merit. Are we making sure that the process, which then uh, that selection process really is judging people on merit? And that's really what it's uh, coming back to. So we're not suddenly saying, right, in 12 months time, we need to get to here. No, because I think um that's more likely to lead to to less than great outcomes um your point about consistency around hiring managers i mean you, <laughs> it's almost impossible to try and get consistency let's face it we can all turn up to the same training session but it's a case of what messages are implanted in our heads and how we uh, how we interpret those but i think um you, you will have um areas of progress, if I can call it that, there'll be these bright spots when people then look and say, well, how on earth are they achieving all of that? And what I'm hoping is it's because you're recruiting a genuinely diverse group. That's why they're able to do things in a very different way and at a different pace. And that will almost be the, you know, taking a, an examples approach to, to and case study approach to then broadening and deepening that kind of mindset change. Right, and tying on to that whole question of how do we track progress here, a question to, to both of you, and I think you, you alluded to it, Adrian, with different data rules all over the globe. Um, for, from a UK um, specific um, perspective here, how can we, we track diversity data whilst making sure we're complying with things like G GDPR? And uh, from both of you, are there any key data points that you would suggest if someone isn't currently tracking diversity data in their hiring, what are the key things that you'd suggest that people start looking at as a first point of uh, development? Um, I might pick up there. Can you hear me okay? Yep. So I think the, um, it's important for the recruiter or the search firm or the company to make sure they, that candidates understand right, our intent is a positive intent. And it, more and more companies are asking their search providers um, to break out what the diversity data is. And 
as a search consultant, you know, I, I think it's really important to have that conversation with your candidate. And I think it's good for candidates to know this is something that we're being held to account on. Sometimes, um, you know, it might not be apparent, for example, that someone is mixed race or that someone is from a different socioeconomic uh, background. So I, I do think that candidates are um, understanding if you share with them, you know, what your mission and your purpose is and trying to get to know them better. Now, most companies are doing a much better job of tracking this. And certainly I know in the UK, um, we've had good guidance from the Department of Business that um, we shouldn't be um, overly nervous about tracking diversity data because uh, we're doing it with a positive intent. Fantastic. Adrian, are there any bits that you would pick up there? You've said you're a data obsessed, I think was the, the phrase you used. What, what yeah. if you were only allowed access to, let's say, three pieces of data in your hiring uh, with a view to diversity, where, where, would, you, where would you start? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of this is going to be quite specific to the organisation and in, in, almost in terms of where you're starting from and recognising, well, actually, what where do you think that you've got um, you know, a, a particular misrepresentation? And that really has, it really needs to be where it starts, because at the end of the day, if it's a business recognised problem, you're more likely to then get people to really buy into what needs to be done, because the hiring is just the start of it, let's face it. You get people in the door and then you need to cultivate them. You need to create that that path to, 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 to development and growth and for them to really to truly to nurture uh, and grow within the business. So for me, um, you know, where we're coming from, obviously, um, with us being uh, a multinational firm, we don't talk specifically about ethnicity. It's much more about culture. So what cultures you come from? Um, and so that's certainly something that we're very cognizant of. Um, we've done, uh, you know, we've made great strides on the gender diversity, um, but that's certainly something that we can always do more of. Um, and then as well, what's becoming much more, um, uh, 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 I think it's going to be difficult to quantify, but I think it's one that at least you can make a distinction when you're then looking to interview people is around the socioeconomic background. What we're doing now is saying, well, when we thought we're running an objective assessment about selecting candidates for interview, what we're actually doing is saying, right, if you've had an unfair advantage, well, not even unfair, you just had an advantage, whether it's through the education you've had or a whole manner of other things, by definition, actually, you're gonna be further ahead than anyone else. So how are we going to level up the playing field a little bit more? So should we be saying, right, you can only interview from candidates from the top 10 universities? Why? You know, to what extent is the, those results from the university much more a reflection of results because of the school that they went to and a whole bunch of other things? How can we then more meaningfully take account of that? And that, as I said, is um, a judgment call. It's very difficult to, to try and use metrics or anything like that. But I think now we've got a greater awareness of how that can skew processes. You can then adjust for it. So it's, it's really about that awareness, I think, just as much as anything else, which is what really Kate was talking about. If you're aware of all of these biases, you're less likely to then perpetuate the biases. Yeah. And another question we've had in from, from Liz, I think for, for both of you again is, um, I think you both touched upon this a little bit, was how do you balance the pressure of filling the position quickly when we all have pressure from businesses saying we, we need this person now because uh, we're struggling without them with the balancing act of that often leading to a, a known entity, someone who can hit the, gra hit the ground running as opposed to proactively seeking to diversify the team? How do you balance those two competing priorities? Kate, hey, shall I start? And maybe you can uh, respond from Please. a recruiter's standpoint. Um, uh, in some regards, I'm uh, a recruiter's uh, best and worst uh, uh, client in the sense that, uh, best in the sense that I'm quite open-minded as to the candidates I'd want to consider and so it's really for them to get 
you know, beyond the surface uh, and really to paint a much fuller picture of those candidates. The flip side is, and they know it, um, particularly those who've worked for me in the past, I'm quite happy for a position to be vacant for nine, 12, even 15 months before I can, I'm prepared to find the right person. Because my view is very simple. If I find the right person, I'm making a bet on them for a good five to 10 years. What's a few months? It's nothing. Um, and, uh, and what that actually then confers in the candidate is, wow, they've got a growth path that they're already buying into. And it's for me to figure out, is that path one that suits that particular candidate or not? It's not about the role. It's about the path. It's the journey. The role is just a start of that journey. Greg and Kay, you must have quite a bit of different experience from uh, hiring managers like Adrian who are happy to wait for that right person and get get the diversity right along, alongside it versus other hiring managers who say, I need to yesterday. Um, so where, where do you fall on, on how to balance those two different objectives? No, I, I wish there were more hiring managers with Adrian's longer term perspective. And I think that's the way I, I love to have every client approach a search. Um, but, you know, often search firms or recruiters, and I imagine you yourself, Rob, in your business, are evaluated on the time to fill. And that can create inordinate pressure to quickly find candidates instead of taking a much more thoughtful, longer term approach. And, you know, I understand there are often um, necessities why clients can't take um, a long term view. And, and you know, for the, the many hiring managers on this call or, and HR directors, I, I think building in the extra time to a schedule that allows you to um, really make sure you've looked under all of those rocks and around those crevices and thought um, more strategically around, you know, where can we flex the role? Um, usually what takes so long in a search isn't actually that research part up front, it's the interview process. And the, um, the many, many weeks it'll take to get a candidate through that stage of the interview process usually can accommodate the extra time up front for the research phase. Yeah. And actually just touching upon one of the points you brought up before, I think you used the term, Kate, bench strength. And it's something that we work very closely with lots of our clients on in running the in-house function is to be less reactive with your recruitment and start proactively thinking about what you might need to hire further down the line and talent, talent pooling as a result so that when the requirement comes in, you've already made a bit of a a bit of a start and you're not standing starting or standing start allowing you to concentrate on diversity as you go i'm just wondering if there was anything that you could share on some of the best practice you've seen with companies doing well in creating that bench strength i'm sorry was that a question rob yeah i was just saying i was wondering if you could share some of the best practice you've seen from companies that you work with in creating bench strength to maybe be a, a um, hidden solution behind these competing priorities of speed and, and diversity? Now we had one client, um, a large financial services firm where you know, they had the most senior woman um, as our sponsor. And we knew um, the, the broad areas they were interested in recruiting for. Um, and we had a, a retainer of uh, a 12 month period. And they um, weren't fussed on whether we came back with um, three candidates or 23 candidates, but um, they were looking for, for um, senior women from um, a, a breadth of firms. And you know, they were happy for it to take as long as um, we could keep finding candidates who met their bar. And it, it made a big difference. And when we approached the candidates um, and we told them who the first interview would be with after their, their Sapphire interview, that spoke volumes at how serious our client was about building bench strength and mm -hmm. about the client's appetite to create roles around the right talent. I think that's something that bigger firms can do better than smaller firms. 
Um, but I, I think smaller firms can certainly do more in this domain as well. So we've had a, another question in around the top of the funnel now. So you've decided you want to improve diversity. What steps can you, but you're not getting good candidates in from, from, um, back, from underrepresented backgrounds. What steps have you both seen that have worked well to open up more diverse talent pools at the top of your funnels? Oh, um, that is a question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's face it, um, th there is no magic bullet out there. Um, I think it's actually going back to relatively simple, straightforward measures, but and recognize that it's going to take a, a while. So um, one of the things, for example, I encourage some of my mentees who reach out and saying, well, you know, I, I'm thinking about going to X, Y, Z. Uh, place you know what are you thinking about it from an inclusive or a, a culture and I said well they all publish the panels that uh, they're all attending or presenting just go and see who they put out there there's your face of your company so if you are truly you know wanting to project that view well let's see go and listen to them and how they talk about those subjects you'll be able to tell so a very similar experience I've gone, but I, I'm going to bring it back much more to, to a completely non-work related uh, situation. It was actually uh, choosing schools for my eldest daughter. Uh, not the most straightforward situation in the current environment, but it's all been done on webinars. And, um, you know, clearly what, you know, where we've been, seen the changes from academic achievement to pastoral care. You know, schools really recognise the distinction you can tell a mile off from the language and how they express it, which head teachers talk about pastoral care and those who talk about it much more as a brand or something to be seen. Those who talk about pastoral care without ever mentioning the words pastoral care are the ones who really get it and have been doing it for donkey's years. Those who keep on talking about it are quite often the ones who are like going, well, how much of this is branding versus actually you've been really thinking about it? So that from a, from a candidate's perspective, I think you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. From an employer's standpoint, you've got to recognize you're going to have to do a lot more then to uh, attract that talent. You're going to have to convince them why things are different and quite how you do that, that's obviously to, uh, dependent upon the organization. Great. Um, well, I'm con conscious of time. I think we've got time for a couple of uh, last final questions. We've got one in from, from Annabelle for, for Kate. So are boards just recruiting to fulfil the demands of initiatives like Hampton Alexander or Parker and have not genuinely bought into the benefits of diversity? Um, you've already said a lot about this, but how do we change boards' perspectives about the real benefits of diversity? So it's a great question, Annabelle. And later in February, I think around the 24th, the Hampton Alexander group is coming back with their final report after five years. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, actually. And, you know, boards, um, obviously it, it, there's a spectrum, um, need to speak to their clients, their consumers and their employees. And there's umpteen research out there now. Rob opened the presentation with some of the great McKinsey research on the better returns that come from having a more diverse board. What we're here to talk about um, at this webinar today is the executive pipeline, which is um, much harder for any candidate to assess because you know, a, a fidelity, for example, might say how many men and women they employ, but that it, what a candidate actually wants to know is, well, what's it like in the part of the business I'm going into? Or what's it like at the level on the ladder where I'm gonna step on? So I, I think the more research, the better, the more seminars like this, the better. And you know, I, I'm quite optimistic that top talent is really savvy in knowing the right questions to ask. As Adrian mentioned it with his example of going and visiting schools. I worry that a lot of companies do have wonderful websites and great brochures, but 
uh, the savviest candidates go and actually speak to people themselves and use their networks and don't just take um, the company's word for it. They actually kick the tires and you know, they, they will ask us as the search firm or if they're working with a different search firm, you know, so give me examples of senior people working flexibly or give me examples of senior people who've come back from maternity leave or, you know, so how many women are running big teams? And so I, I think it's incumbent on all of us, um, depending on our role in the process, to try and help candidates look underneath the covers and um, understand more about, you know, the attrition and retention and, and promote the different role models that perhaps aren't um, the ones out in front. Right. And uh, Adrian, I'll, I'll leave final final word to, to you with a quick, quick fire question, quick, quick answer. I think you, when you spoke, you mentioned that investment management's behind other areas of financial services. What one lesson should the investment management industry take from other areas of financial services to uh, close that gap? Um, pace over perfection. Don't assume you're going to get it right straight away. It's going to iterate. But what you do need to do is really embrace it and get on with it. Because if you don't, you're not going to have the talent and the business to survive. And I think that's, that's my message to investment management. There's huge change coming down the line. You need to get that talent in the business right now. Superb. Well, that just leaves me to wrap up and say a massive thank you to both Kate and Adrian. I think really informative speakers today. And thanks for your candid answers to all of those fantastic questions. Um, just quickly finish by sharing some of the upcoming webinars we've got uh, in the continuation of this series. So I've uh, got one on the 10th of February on global mobility and ultra flexible working. I think we touched on it a little bit today, but what more can we be doing there? Um, another session on the 17th of February on how to empower working parents in, in, a, in a remote working place. Um, as I said at the beginning, we'll be sending around feedback form. We'd love to hear what you thought of this session, as well as other topics that you'd like us to cover. Uh, and once again, massive thanks to, to Kate and Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, Rob.